Hey, 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 YouTube. Baylor here in the big cozy chair. And today I want to talk about Silence Rare cards. She's got 19 different rare cards. The focus of today's video is going to be to talk about each of these, when they're a good card to pick up, when you should upgrade them, and what kind of uh, relics you should look out for when considering whether to pick these up. Without further ado, let's take a look at them. Starting with a thousand cuts. You get to be alphabetically first because of that A, but that doesn't mean you're first in my heart, a thousand cuts. I do like the design of this card. One damage to all enemies or two with the upgrade. If you have a thousand cuts, you really do want to get it upgraded making it twice as powerful, uh, particularly when you're doubling the numerical effect of a two-cost card. Uh, you can kind of think of this upgrade as being play an entire another copy of 1,000 cuts. For the most part, 1,000 cuts just isn't enough damage to be worth paying two energy for. You have to really be playing a lot of cards per turn, and cards that can really support that include things like, of course, Blade Dance, giving you lots and lots of shivs, um, Cloak and Daggers also creating shivs can be pretty good too. Things like uh, Endless Agony or Distraction, any, any card that's two cards in one really helps with the thousand cuts. Also a lot better if you have a relic like the Mummified Hand, which makes cards in your hand free when you play a power, or if you're otherwise able to get this in play for cheap, such as with a Sneko Eye, it can also make a thousand cuts pretty good. Don't really like Thousand Cuts much in the early game, although I'll say if you're facing Slime Boss, this can be a really good floor one take as it's one of the, the few really good answers Silent has to that combat in Act 1. For the most part, though, it's just a little bit too slow to be useful in the Act 1 fights, and you won't find it that useful against your elites. All in all, I'd say this is a mostly avoid card, but if you've got either lots and lots of cards that you're playing, or if you've got a mummified hand, or maybe it's coming upgraded for free or something, then... Think about it. Comparatively, Adrenaline is, I think, one of the most takeable cards that Silent has in the rare pool. It's just free energy to you. You gain one energy and draw two cards for zero cost and one card. That's a net gain of one energy and one card. The upgrade, of course, being one more energy. That's pretty dang good. Adrenaline is almost always an improvement to your deck, with uh, very, very, very few exceptions. Those exceptions, of course, being a particular couple of relics. Notably, the boss relic Velvet Choker, which limits you to uh, playing fewer than six cards per turn. Uh, or if you're using the Pocket Watch, which gives you additional draw for playing three or fewer cards during your turn. These can both be reasons not to want an Adrenaline. However, the biggest reason not to take an Adrenaline is just if you're offered a better rare card. It's all basically always true that this card is a great addition to your deck. But it's not always true that there's not a better option. Maybe you'd prefer a Malaise, maybe you'd prefer a Wraithform, maybe you'd prefer a Corpse Explosion to an Adrenaline, and, you know, you should at least think about the other options that you've got. It also does relatively poorly with Sneko Eye, although it can still be worth it, since it does give some energy back and does draw some more cards for you. All in all, a really, really takeable, very, very good card. It's not quite offering from Ironclad, but it does just fine. And pairing well with Adrenaline is a card like After Image. This is the block version of Thousand Cuts, one block per card you play, but I tend to think After Image is a lot more generically useful than the Thousand Cuts. That's partially because it's a one cost power compared to the two cost of the Thousand Cuts, but also because I think the block effect is more useful than the area effect damage of the Thousand Cuts, uh, at least at the one-to-one -one basis. This card is very notable for helping Silent block against the Beat of Death effect of Heart. Heart's Beat of Death says you take damage every time you play a card, and this, well, perfectly counteracts that with the right amount of block. Although if you're playing on Ascension 20, you're going to need two copies to uh, to fully counteract Beat of Death. And that's a really helpful way to get decks that have lots of card spam as their strategy to survive in those fights. If you're playing lots of shivs with Blade Dance, or if you're doing some kind of discard comboing, maybe you're cycling prepareds and tacticians, these are all situations where the after image becomes really, really good. It's also, of course, another great one with uh, Mummified Hand, making powers free, and can be a particularly fun one in uh, cross-class synergies, maybe with Prismatic Shard. Overall, pretty solid. It's not typically all that much block per turn. You can think of after image as probably three block per turn if you're in Act 1. Depending on the, the cards in your deck or your energy output, it can go up to more than that. But at least at the very start, I tend to think footwork is a little bit better in terms of defense. 
but only a little bit, and it's pretty easy to make after image the better block card. Alchemize. This one's a personal favorite of mine. Alchemize lets you obtain a random potion and then removes itself from play for the rest of combat with that exhaust. The whole point of Alchemize is to enable you to either constantly use potions, and that can be particularly useful if you have any of the potion relics, which are really, uh, really the relics that will encourage you to pick up an Alchemize. So those are, of course, more potion slots from the potion belt. If you can hold more potions, then there's more value to generating them. If you heal from your potions with a toy ornithopter, then generating a potion every combat is going to be really, really useful. There's the Sacred Bark boss relic that makes potions more powerful, and that can also be a really good reason to take uh, an Alchemize. Overall, what Alchemize really lets you do is spend a little bit of your resource, one card and one energy, or upgraded no energy, and turn that into a resource that you can take into the next combat. So I like to think of Alchemize as take a small penalty during regular combats and then have more options available to you during boss and elite combats. That's where Alchemize really shines. It's also, of course, excellent with any kind of exhaust synergy. So if you're getting a new card from, say, Dead Branch, then Alchemize can be really good. Also worth noting that the Ghost in a Jar potion is uh, the silent exclusive rare potion and can be a, a really big impact on whether your run wins or not, if you've got a ghost in a jar. Alchemize lets you look at more potions, so increases your odds of finding a ghost in a jar. And that's very, 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 very powerful. The Strange Spoon Relic lets you potentially keep cards that exhaust when played, and I think that's an exceptional interaction with Alchemize. I want to say, generally speaking, that the Strange Spoon combos with the rare cards of most characters, because there are so many exhaust keywords in the rare pool. I think that's enough said about Alchemize. Overall, a, a really good one. I love Alchemize on Floor Zero, because it lets you fill up the potion slots quickly. I, I tend to like it after the first boss for the constant potion generation as well. But just like Adrenaline, there may be a better option amongst your choices. Bullet Time! This one's cool. I, I struggle to like Bullet Time sometimes, but uh, at times Bullet Time can be a very, very good rare. Bullet Time makes everything else in your hand free, so you can kind of think of this as an energy generating card that gives you energy equal to the cost of the rest of your hand. Now that can be an awful lot. Uh, the obvious and powerful synergies with Bullet Time are Runic Pyramid, since you accumulate cards into your hand over time, and Bullet Time makes them all free, so you can play all 10 cards. And Snekowai, which draws you a large hand of randomly costed cards. Bullet Time also just makes that entire hand free and lets you play it consistently. The other situations where Bullet Time can be good is if you can get a lot of cards into your hand with some card draw. The Bullet Time upgrade makes it go down to two costs, so the strategy then becomes use all but two of your energy to draw as many cards as possible with cards like Expertise or Acrobatics to get lots or Backflip to get lots of cards in hand and then make everything that remains free with the Bullet Time. So Bullet Time is, I think, more useful as you have more card draw, although of course note that once you play it, you cannot draw additional cards this turn. That's applied as a debuff, so you can block it with Artifact or remove it with Orange Pellets and continue to draw cards, but note that only the cards that are in your hand when bullet time is played are made free. If you play bullet time and then figure out a way to draw more cards, those new, new cards will be at their regular cost. Overall, a bit of a niche card. You do need lots of card draw in order for this to, uh, to be really good, I think. Yeah, well-laid well -laid plans can also get you more cards in hand in, in the same way, and you may even get some real fanciness by, for example, stacking multiple copies of well-laid plans to allow you to retain four cards so that you can play them all for free with bullet time. Burst! Burst featured really, really powerfully in uh, the run that we just did where we were able to burst Catalyst to, to double that. Bursting lets you play a skill twice. There's lots of good targets in the Silent Pool for Burst. Burst Adrenaline for tons of card draw and energy. Burst Alchemize for two potions. Burst Malaise for tons of negative strength on an enemy. Burst um, Nightmare to make six copies of a card. 
burst your poison cards. And I think that is really where uh, where burst shines most is in combination with poison cards, doubling bouncing flask or crippling cloud, or of course catalyst, which is a multiplying poison card. And if doubled is either four X or nine X poison, depending on whether it's upgraded or not. And a bursted catalyst plus is an instant kill on almost anything in the spire. But it can also work with stuff like backflip, uh, piercing whale, I've seen a deck where Burst Calculated Gamble with Tingsha and Tough Bandages was the was the entire mechanic, and that was pretty cool too. But any any silent deck where you're reliant on skills for either your offense or your defense or even your utility, Burst can serve you really, really well. One good target for the Burst is, of course, Corpse Explosion. Corpse Explosion's a, a cool silent rare. It's like a... I almost want to call it a hybrid card, because yes, it applies poison. But this secondary effect of doing area effect damage when the poisoned enemy dies is not dependent on having poison at all or doing any specific amount of damage with the poison. So you're allowed to play Corpse Explosion on, for example, one of the three slavers in Act 2 and then kill that slaver with your deadly deadly knives, your upgraded glass knife, your upgraded die die die, your dagger spray, what have you. And the explode effect of the Corpse Explosion will happily take out remaining minions on the field. This is all about taking a multi-enemy fight and essentially turning it into a single enemy fight. All you have to do is kill the enemy with the highest HP and all of them will die. You can also do fun things like stack this card, multiple copies, on a low HP enemy and use that to deal lots of damage to a larger opponent. Um, that's a fun use against the orbs of Bronze Automaton, or against the Torch Heads of Collector in particular. Really like this card. It's it's great with poison, it's great without poison, uh, although the two costs can be a little bit difficult. One final note on this card, both the apply six poison and the following statement when the enemy dies, deal damage equal to its max HP to all enemies, both of those are debuffs, so Corpse Explosion as a card is applying two debuffs to the enemy, and will therefore consume two stacks of artifacts making it a really useful way to remove those artifact charges from the Spheric Guardian, Donu and Dekka, Spire Shield and Spire Spear, and so forth. A very, very good card in particular for Donu and Dekka. That's a, a fairly challenging boss fight that gets like really trivialized by this card. The two effects occur in the order that, the, that they're listed on the card. So poison first, then the explosion effect second. That's true for any card in Spire that has multiple effects. They'll always resolve in the order of the card text. So for example, Crippling Cloud is poison first, then weak to all enemies. Die, die, die. This one's pretty straightforward. 13 damage to all enemies, upgrades to 17. Corpse Explosion has a great upgrade, by the way. Plus three poison on a two cost card is, is really significant, being more damage than the upgrade on Deadly Poison. This only gets plus two. And notably doing the damage to the one enemy that you need the damage on since they'll kill everything else when they die. Da 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 is a great straightforward uh, front-loaded AoE card. Silent can really struggle in fights that require you to take down one enemy quickly, like the Three Slavers, like Reptomancer, like Gremlin Leader, and the amount of damage this card does is high enough that it's a, a very solid answer to those, those particular combats. I really like it as a, an early game pickup, but it's also just a really nice thing to have going into Act 2, so if you see it after your first boss and there's not many other better options, I really do like it. Die 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 gets a lot better, of course, with any kind of attack boost. Particularly good with Pen Nib, letting you double its damage, but also maybe Bag of Marbles, any source of Vulnerable. Uh, or if you're able to multiply it otherwise, such as with Phantasmal Killer, then it can be pretty good. It's hardly exceptional, it's, it's not quite as overwhelming as Immolate on Ironclad, but it is the most damaging AoE attack that Silent has access to, and that's definitely noteworthy. It does struggle a little bit to scale, yes. Where Die 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 does suffer is that it really doesn't play a big role in your late game, since there are relatively few ways to multiply this card. You can do it with Vulnerable and Phantasmal Killer, but that's pretty hard to do. That said, an upgraded Die 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 is still useful right up all the way to the end of the game in Act 4, helping you kill Spire Spear and Spire Shield that much more quickly. Don't negate the value of such cards in that combat. Doppelganger. I think this is one of my favorite uh, silent cards for its design. I like to think of Doppelganger as a, a bad card with a good upgrade. So let me let me talk about that real quick. 
It's an X cost card that gives you X card draw and X energy on the next turn. So you're essentially carrying your energy over from one turn to the next and gaining one card per energy that you carried over. A lot of the times that doesn't do much, particularly if you draw this alongside a hand of cards where you can spend all of your energy, then the doppelganger doesn't do anything except be a dead card in your hand. But in a deck that's generating excess energy, it can be a lot more useful, enabling you to have a, a really big hand of cards that can potentially combo together. So I think the things that there are, there are a few factors that, that can lead towards Doppelganger being pretty good. One of them is the upgrade. The upgrade on Doppelganger both increases the card draw and the energy gain next turn. And if you compare this to some of the other upgrades in Slay the Spire, you'll note why it is kind of above the curve. There's a lot of upgrades in Spire that either give you plus one energy, most energy generating cards will upgrade for plus one energy, and a lot of card draw cards will upgrade for one more card scene, like Acrobatics here gives you plus one card, Gremlin gives you plus one energy, and the same is true of the similar cards on the other characters. But there are no cards except Doppelganger that upgrade for both a card and an energy. And so to me that means that this upgrade is extremely high value. One card and one energy for one upgrade is a very good deal, even though it is next turn. Doppelganger is of course also an X cost card, so it benefits from the Chemical X Shop Relic, increasing the effect of X cost cards by two. With a Chemical X, uh, which Silent already wants because she has three X cost cards, with a Chemical X Doppelganger becomes insane, being plus two draw, and plus two energy, even if played for zero, unupgraded. So I really like Doppelganger with Chemical X. I like it if you can get a free upgrade or have an upgrade to spare for it. And I also like Doppelganger in situations where you have cards that need to be drawn together to work. So I like it with stuff like Finisher, which has to be drawn alongside other attacks and is more powerful the more other attacks that you, that you can play alongside it. Or with cards like Choke, which reward you for having one big turn where you play a lot of other cards. But for the most part, it does does uh, fall into the category of being harder to use and less convenient than the Adrenaline. Let's talk Envenom here. I like what Envenom does. One poison whenever you deal unblocked attack damage. That's one poison per hit. So a card like Riddle with Holes here, which hits five times, will apply poison five times. And if you have the Sneko Skull Relic that increases poison by one whenever it's applied, then Envenom will be two poison instead. At two cost, I think Envenom often struggles to compete with the likes of Bouncing Flask and Crippling Cloud in terms of the amount of total poison that you can do. Both Crippling Cloud and Bouncing Flask do a ton of poison right away, um, whereas Envenom is slowly doing damage over time. It, it's really just kind of a, a slow way to get your poison, I find. But it can be a really nice way to scale up your damage over time for the end game, And it does have a few nice little interactions. You really do want the upgrade, making it one cost is so much easier to put it in play so that you can get that poison ticking that much faster. A lot more viable with a mummified hand as well. And of course, as aforementioned, the Sneko Skull really makes it exceptional. I think a really cool interaction here in Venom plus the rare colorless card, Sadistic Nature. Sadistic Nature does damage every time you apply a debuff to an enemy. And Poison is a debuff, so if you combine the Sadistic Nature and the Envenom, you'll be doing bonus damage with every single attack that you play, in addition to the Poison, and that's pretty good. That's pretty good. Other than that, Venom, of course, is pretty good with multi-attacking cards like the Glass Knife, like Shivs, etc. Venom is my favorite way to take a silent deck that kind of has two separate halves. If you've got attacks to deal with um, short-lived enemies and poison cards to deal with bosses, then an Venom can be a really cool way to, so to speak, tie those two halves of the deck together and create a unified strategy. Again, it is it is in one of the slower poison cards. Not a good card at the start of the game. Unlike Glass Knife, which is an exceptional card at the start of the game, Glass Knife does 16 damage and then decreases its damage, or eight damage twice, and then decreases the damage by two per hit. 
So next time you play it is six damage twice, then four twice, then two twice, all the way down to zero. This card can do zero damage. And at face value, this doesn't seem that good. Sure, 16 damage is all right, but it quickly degrades to almost nothing. Important thing to remember with Glass Knife is that most fights don't last very long, and frequently you're unable to play this more than two times. So I like to think of this as 16 and then 12 the second time, but more importantly than that, Glass Knife has a crazy powerful upgrade, upping the damage by plus 4 twice, or plus 8 total damage for an upgrade. That is more than any other one-cost attack in Slay the Spire, I believe. And a Glass Knife Plus just does absolutely ludicrous amounts of damage for one energy, enabling the Silent to effortlessly dispatch tough opponents in Act 1 and Act 2. Really good against the Gremlin Knob, really good to pick off a Sentry, a Jaw Worm, like, you, if it has less than 100 hit points, Glass Knife basically deletes it from the field. And that's an invaluable thing, being able to take an enemy out of the out of the fight very quickly. If this does zero damage, then no, it will not apply poison via Envenom. Great question, Hawkeye. You have to actually do damage to apply poison. And a quick note along that vein is that Envenom does not apply poison to the heart if you've already capped damage against the heart for the turn. So that can be an interesting way to get denied this bonus. I really like Glass Knife as a starter card or even just as a uh, pick this up going into Act 2 kind of thing. The value of the Glass Knife is really dependent on whether you can upgrade it or not, and I consider this an exceedingly high priority upgrade. Much more difficult to use than the Glass Knife is Grand Finale. For zero costs, you can do 50 damage to all enemies if and only if there are no cards in the draw pile, and that is much easier said than done. You have to have zero cards to draw. Doesn't matter how many are in your discard pile, but you just... You must have zero cards in draw pile. The way to do that is, of course, to draw all of the cards in the draw pile. And then have Grand Finale in hand. So I tend to consider that there are two important components to successful Grand Finale use. The first is draw control. Cards that can draw cards from your draw pile, ideally in varying numbers. Um, so a couple cards that can draw one card, a card that can draw two cards, like Backflip, a card that can draw three or more, an Acrobatics, or better yet, something flexible, like Calculated Gamble, which draws one per card in your hand, or Expert Piece, which draws you up to a particular total. Both of these can be used to, uh, to draw a varying amount of cards to ensure that you exactly line up zero cards in Draw Pile. Doppelganger can work to that end, too. And the second aspect that the Grand Finale needs is Retain. You need to be able to hold on to the Grand Finale in your hand so that you can play it when there's nothing left in the draw pile. Well-Aid Plans or Runic Pyramid can get that to happen. Hey, hey everyone. Did you know that you can now support me directly on YouTube by getting a channel membership? For as low as five bucks a month, you'll get access to perks like custom badges and emojis to use in comments and discounts on the merch store. All while helping support me and this channel to do what I love every day. Just click the join button below to get started. Now back to the video. You can of course also play the grand finale effectively by making a very small deck of cards. If there are only five cards in your deck, then you can just play grand finale for free on turn one. Although that's pretty difficult to do. But in general, I like grand finale most in, access, uh, in decks that have access to retain and in decks that have access to lots of card draw. Just a quick tip though, be careful. You have to consider all of the different things that can draw you cards or that can add cards to the draw pile. Um, including enemies that add statuses to the draw pile can mess with this. Um, if you play a power that changes the number of cards that you play in your turn, or if you have a relic that draws you cards, that can catch you off guard, right? If you didn't remember to account for it. Ink Bottle in particular can prove disastrous because it draws cards in a way that's a little difficult to control. But if you can pull all that off, I think Grand Finale is one of the coolest and most powerful rare cards the Silent has. Uh, one of my favorites to pick up going into Act 2 with uh, well-laid plans, or better yet, with a Runic Pyramid. Yeah, exactly. A card that should either be the main focus of your deck, or you probably shouldn't bother. I think I've had a deck that was, uh, that did secondary Grand Finale once, but pretty weird. Pretty weird. Trom says, you like to have cards that can draw odd slash even numbers, because it's easier to calculate. I like that, yeah. Just focusing on having the right amount. Very much a deck-defining card, that's right. Compared to Malaise, which I think is a very good support card. The other rare X-cost card for the Silent, Malaise, 
says enemy loses X strength. That's a permanent reduction. They'll they'll lose that strength for the whole battle. And that is exceptionally good for slowing down enemies that scale their strength over time, particularly bosses, as well as just shutting down multi-attacking enemies. This card does massive amounts of work in Act 2 and Act 3 because there are so many different enemies that are really neutered by a strength reduction, such as the Awakened One, the Time Eater, Writhing Mass, Snake Plant, Book of Stabbing in particular, is uh, countered very well by Malaise, and it's one of the best answers Silent has to the Book of Stabbing. The Three Birds, the Shelled Parasite is quite weak to this, since that's a slower fight, and of course, invaluable against Heart, because this can purge the heart's strength for one round of multi-attacks. The heart will eventually remove the strength down, but it won't remove the weaken, which is the second component of it. And that weaken in conjunction with the strength down really makes this a deadly effective uh, block card. Love malaise in any situation where you're able to spend a lot of energy on it. Uh, the upgrade makes it uh, one more, so that's always nice too. Really like malaise also with the common relic or a calcum which gives you automatic block if you end your turn without any. Six block at end of turn. And if you play Malaise, reducing the enemy's output to almost zero with all of your energy, then Orichalcum can block for whatever's left, which I think is uh, pretty dang good. I tend to think of Malaise as better than Disarm in a lot of ways. The fact that it's um, that it can potentially be more reduction then Disarm is, is quite useful, and they're both single-use cards. The Attached Weaken is also super, super nice, so Malaise is useful even against uh, beefy single-hit opponents like the Giant Head, because weakening them still reduces the damage output by 25%. Malaise also exceptional with anything that lets you have a lot of energy on one turn. In particular, I'm thinking Ice Cream, which can let you save up energy over multiple turns to spend on one big, devastating malaise, which can completely shut down a boss, for example. Overall, I really like malaise. I think it's a, a great addition. It is a, a defense-oriented card, so you, of course, need to have a, a damage plan for it to really help you out, but it's great. Nightmare. This is a card I used to consider exceptionally powerful, but lately I've found it, it often feels a little bit overkill. Nightmare is a very expensive card, three cost upgraded down to two, that lets you create three new copies of a card in your hand. And the whole idea behind Nightmare is that you can create three copies of a either a very powerful card or a single-use card. Anything that says Exhaust on it is a good target for Nightmare. So you can make lots of potions with Alchemize, lots of card draw with Adrenaline. Uh, two of the most popular targets for Nightmare are Wraith Form for lots and lots of intangible. That's pretty much invincibility for a whole fight. Uh, and Catalyst, which lets you get so very much poison on one target. But a couple of the things that can also work as targets include Footwork for lots of deck scaling. Um, basically any power. Multiple After Images, multiple Noxious Fumes. I've even done Nightmare Thousand Cuts before, and that was pretty fun. The Infinite Intangible com Combo. Yes, there are uh, Wraith Form and Nightmare together can, can form a, an infinite amount of intangible if you work together. If you get two copies of Nightmare, you can use one to duplicate the other, and then you can use those duplicated Nightmares to continue to copy each other as well as copy other cards. So two Nightmares can create infinite copies of any card if you can manipulate the rest of the deck enough. And that can be a thou that can be infinite intangible, that can be infinite potions, that can be infinite money if you can get uh, if you can get your hands on Wish from Watcher. That would probably be the most powerful thing you could do with uh, with two Nightmares. But even just within the silent cards, there's lots of fun targets for that. Nightmare Malaise has been an answer to uh, to many uh, an Act 3 boss for me as well. But a lot of the time, I find that you're often able to win the fight with just the one copy of the card. Especially when it comes to something like Wraith Form or Catalyst. Oftentimes for me, the one Wraith Form or the one Catalyst is fine, and I don't need the three extra copies. Um, but if you're if you're duplicating just a single footwork or something like that, that can be pretty useful. A couple other targets that might be interesting, by the way, Blur is one of my favorites. Lots of copies of Blur can result in being able to retain your block for an entire combat. 
Um, lots of copies of something like Tactician or Reflex could enable a, a discard deck to, to really pop off. Or three copies of, heck, Grand Finale on the turn before you draw your last card. Very much a, a card that's too clunky and too heavy to pick up in the early game. Uh, this is very much an, a late Act 2 or, or, or Act 3 card. I generally can't imagine this being too useful before your Act 2 boss. Last thing to note is that Nightmare will copy permanent cost reductions, but not temporary ones. So if a card is temporarily zero cost from, say, Mummified Hand, and you make copies of it, the versions you get next turn will be at their regular cost. However, if you duplicate a card that is zero cost from either Snekawai or from Madness, then the Nightmare will create zero cost copies. And that can be really powerful. Nightmare and Snekawai are exceptionally strong together. And that's a very much good example of a time where Nightmare sh should be an easy pick is with Snekawai. All right, Phantasmal Killer. This is one of the cards that got a buff in the 2.2 patch wow, nearly a year ago now. It's now a one cost card with an upgrade down to zero cost of next turn your attacks deal double damage. You can kind of think of it as one turn of wrath, but there's there's also no downside to it, right? You don't take double damage, which is kind of cool. Or yeah, we're two weeks ago on iOS, that's true, so it's still a, a new change for some players. That's pretty exciting. Phantasmal Killer is a, a little bit awkward, but if you can get it to work, I think it's a, a really powerful way to scale the silence physical attacks. Um, being exceptional with stuff like Glass Knife, um, with Grand Finale, with Die Die Die, with Skewer. If you are playing a bunch of attacks, and particularly if you already have some way to scale your attacks, such as Vulnerable with Terror or any Relic that gives the Silent Strength, then a Phantasmal Killer is worth thinking about. Like all next turn effects, Phantasmal Killer gets a bit better if you have access to some kind of Retain, be it well aid Plans or Runic Pyramid, just anything that can guarantee that you draw attacks on the next turn, because that is of course the risk, right? If you play this card and then the turn afterward you don't draw any attack cards, you don't get to do anything with it. And that is a sad time. Highly recommend Phantasmal Killer with something like Burst, by the way. If you play multiple copies of Phantasmal Killer, their duration will stack. So two Phantasmal Killers becomes double damage on your next two turns. And three becomes three turns, so on and so forth. I think it's a surprisingly good early game pickup. Right at the start of the game, the Silent is entirely dependent on physical attacks. And a Phantasmal Killer fits in pretty well, now that it's only one cost. All in all, I think a little bit, uh, one of the more awkward cards for the Silent. But definitely worth picking up sometimes, these days. Storm of Steel. I think one of my most maligned silent rares. This also got an upgrade in the 2.2 patch, going from 2 cost down to 1 cost. The upgraded is still... Uh, what Storm of Steel does is discard every card in your hand and gives you a shiv, or upgraded shiv, to replace each one that you discarded. Real problem with Storm of Steel is unfortunately that one shiv per card in hand is not a good deal, generally speaking. To evaluate whether Storm of Steel is a reasonable addition to your deck, I think a simple question you can ask yourself is this. What does more damage? One shiv or one strike? If the answer is the strike card, then Storm of Steel becomes something that you want to play only after you've played all of the other basic cards in your hand, and it's really not going to add much value, enabling you to maybe play a shiver two. In order for Storm of Steel then to become useful, you need to have some kind of interacting effect or relic that boosts the shiv specifically. Strength alone is not enough. You know, if you if you have additional points of strength, then the other attack cards in your hand are also going to get bonus damage, and you'd still rather play those than play the Storm of Steel. But there are a few relics that can really boost what the Storm of Steel does. Uh, mostly in the rare pool. I'm thinking Tingsha, which adds 3 damage to each card. So 7 damage per shiv instead of 4, which is a, a much better deal. Um, Tough Bandages gives you 3 block per card discarded. That can be pretty sweet. And best of all, Dead Branch causes each exhausted shiv to add a new random card to your hand. 
Dead Branch alone makes Storm of Steel into a very exceptional card to add to your deck because it becomes for one cost, make a bunch of shivs, and entirely reroll your hand. It can also be very useful if you have any of the attack relics, the shuriken, the kunai, the ornamental fan, or of course a copy of accuracy to boost the damage of your shivs. These can all uh, increase the value of Storm of Steel, but, but barring the dead branch, I tend to think you need multiple things in Storm of Steel's favor for it to be good. That makes it not good at the start of the run. That makes it not good if you don't have any supporting relics. And that's right, the Wrist Blade, which boosts the damage of zero cost attacks, can also help quite a bit too. The upgrade really doesn't feel that much, feel like that much. Two, two damage per card. I think a good comparison for Storm of Steel is the Ironclad card Fiendfire. And looking at the two side by side, I think it becomes really apparent why Storm of Steel is get kind of gets the short stick. Both remove your entire hands and do damage per card, but Fiendfire does at, by default, 7 damage per card instead of 4, and I think it's easier for the Ironclad to get exhaust interactions than it is for the Silent to get uh, boosts to the shivs from Storm of Steel. It's just kind of behind the curve. Now, if Storm of Steel gave upgraded shivs right away, I think I'd be more interested in it. But it just doesn't do enough damage per card, really, to be a, a good deal currently. There are some kind of wonky interactions you could maybe do by discarding Tactician or Reflex. In practice, I think those are very difficult to make happen with a Storm of Steel, because you have to discard everything, right? You can't just discard one or two cards. And for that same reason, it it's, doesn't work with some other cards you'd like it to work with, like Finisher, for example. Dealing six damage for each attack played this turn, if only you could keep this in your hand. If only. One other kind of cool interaction is the Unceasing Top Rare Relic which rewards you with card draw for emptying your hand, although this is a little unreliable too, because what if you draw a card that you can't play, like a Sender's Bane, or a Wound, or who knows what. Still, it's worth thinking about. So there's some reasons you might want to take Storm of Steel. There's lots of reasons you don't want to take Storm of Steel, but it's got at least some utility. Alright, last three real quick here. Tools of the Trade, it's the Silent card draw power, everybody's got one. Silence one gives you draw one and discard one each turn. You don't actually get any more cards in your hand, but you get to look at one more card each turn, and that's pretty useful, especially if you have other cards that interact with discard effects, like a Tactician, like a Reflex, like a Sneaky Strike, or like an Eviscerate. Um, the tools of the trade could be really, really useful. It's also probably the best way to activate the Hovering Kite unique boss relic for the silent, which is one energy each time you discard a, uh, the first time you discard a card. At discarding one card right at the start of every turn is optimal for lining that up. I really like that Tools of the Trade is a power that upgrades to be free. These are relatively few and far between in Spire, and shouldn't be disregarded. Uh, being able to make a, a power one cost cheaper is very, very useful for getting set up more quickly. This, of course, becomes great with, say, a Mummified Hand or with either of the discard relics, but often gets, I think, a little overshadowed by some of the other rare cards on offer. Tools of the Trade, also worth noting as a discard card that's quite useful with the Runic Pyramid, since it allows you to discard a card each turn, uh, enabling you to get rid of otherwise unplayable cards that would clog your hand. And for the, for the Watcher's uh, draw power, I think I would qualify Study. As the, as the draw power here, giving you these insights that, uh, that draw two. That averages out to one card draw every turn. It's definitely a weird way to get there. You could also consider Rushdown, although I think that's not quite the same. Um, comparing to, say, Brutality on Ironclad, as opposed to Dark Embrace, right? One card per turn, not one card whenever you want. From, from Dark Embrace. Unload's weird. Unload seems like a card that's trying to do two things pretty well, but it does neither of them usefully. 14 or upgraded 18 damage is pretty decent. You know, there's not a lot of attacks that, that can do that much. Uh, unfortunately, it gets overshadowed in this regard by Glass Knife, which does just way more damage for the same price as the Unload. And the Unload also discards all your non-attack cards. In theory, this allows you to discard things like Reflex and Tactician, enables you to 
set up an eviscerate play or maybe enables you to create hand space, but in practice I often find that unload is discarding cards that I want to retain with my well-laid plans or my runic pyramids, such as my apparitions, my wraith form, my catalyst, my block cards, any of that. And because you're not allowed to pick and choose which cards you discard, uh, unload will often end up getting rid of stuff that you wanted. That makes it pretty awkward. It is true that sometimes unload can be useful with the discard effects, again, most frequently with discard relics like tough bandages or tingsha, but mostly I just find it to be a pain in my butt. And that means that unload is a, a rare card I, I very infrequently find myself taking. It is totally fine on floor one, just for the front-loaded damage that it provides, but again, outclassed by the glass knife and the die 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 in this regard. So unless you don't have a better damage option, or you do somehow benefit from this discard all non-attack cards in your hand effect, then you probably don't want the unload. What you probably do want is good old Wraith Form. This card used to be four intangible with the upgrade. Currently two intangible upgrades to three. That's two or three turns of outright invulnerability. Wraith Form is one of the most powerful defensive cards in the whole dang game, I think, and probably the most widely useful of Silence Rare Pool. Basically allows you to completely ignore what your opponents are doing and focus on your own plan for a couple of turns. And I think that Wraith Form is more, most effective in decks where you can use those couple of free turns to maximal effect. That means either doing tons and tons of damage, often with poison. Catalyst and Wraith Form are best of buds. Um, you can also spam attacks during those free turns, or playing a bunch of other powers and getting set up in some fashion. For example, nightmaring a, a block a footwork or a, a fumes or something. Wraith Form works best when you can either duplicate it so that you're able to extend the intangible duration over an entire fight, really good with, say, Duplication Potion, or, uh, or with Nightmare, and of course best when you can hold on to it, when you can retain it until the latest possible moment to make the best use of the intangible. That's great with, of course, well-laid plans and with the Runic Pyramid boss relic. Worth noting that this Dexterity loss, which is a, a pretty hefty penalty, right? You quickly lose the ability to block once you've played the Wraith Form. So once you play Wraith Form, you need to end the fight fairly quickly. Again, doing damage is going to be the best way to, to make that happen. But you can also prevent this debuff by having an artifact in, on your character when you play the Wraith Form from an Ancient Potion or the Clockwork Souvenir. You can also use the Orange Pellet's Shop Relic by playing a power attack and a skill to remove the Dexterity loss each turn. I think Intangible combos with itself really well, so if you can get other sources of Intangible like Apparitions or like the Incense Burner, which our previous run made use of, then that can stack together for even more effects. I do think intangibility is is much better when, when masked, so to speak. The more you have, the better it is. But overall, a very, very exceptional card. I'll take Wraith Form probably 80% of the time that I see it. The three costs can be a, a real problem, and if you if you have a really good block plan already, you may not need the Wraith Form. For example, if you've got upgraded footworks or multiple after images, or you're um, another good situation where you may not want the Wraith Form is if you have the Paper Crane Relic causing weakened enemies to only deal 60% of their normal damage output, and blocking the rest with intangible might not be as valuable. But overall, it's an exceptional card, and I think one of the best, if not the best, of the Silent Rares. So there you have it. That's my. Those are my thoughts on each and every one of the, the Silent Rares. If you liked this video, please throw me a like below and let me know in the comments which of the Silent Rares is your personal favorite. Hope you enjoyed this video. Thanks so much for watching, everybody. I'll catch you all next time. And ta-ta for now. Hey, hey, everyone. Thanks so much for watching. Did you know that I'm live five days a week on Twitch? Come join us to watch me live, ask questions, or chill with the community. Click the link in the description below to follow and be notified when I'm live. And while you're down there, make like a sandwich and sub to this channel for more fresh Baylor content. Ta-ta for now.